I'm largely talking today about what I've called simple congenital heart disease interventions. Uh, that means I'll focus then on briefly what's involved in a right heart uh, cath, then ASDs, and the bulk of the time will be spent on uh, ASDs, whether it be secundum ASD, ABSD, sinus phenosis defect, and I'll touch on plastic knee or orthodeoxy syndrome, and then spend a little bit of time on BSD and PDA um, as it pertains to devices, but also explore the anatomy uh, around these, anatomy physiology around these. Um, as a separate talk, I'm ha and I, I, I thought it was a bit much to try and squeeze it all into an hour, but as a separate talk, I can do um, more complex interventions, uh, in particular exploring the role, the, the ins and outs of um, uh, Fontan physiology, for example, and often discussing interventions in that group can be quite um, useful to improve understanding as well as transposition in baffles uh, and that sort of thing, which is, can be quite uh, poorly understood. So firstly, the right heart cath, um, the, this is usually performed via the femoral vein, equally can be performed via the brachial vein uh, or jugular vein. Either way, they in general will lead back to the, uh, straight back to the right atrium. Uh, one condition I had the other day where, where that's not necessarily the case is called an interrupted IVC, but usually you've got other congenital conditions where that happens, but in, in, uh, that occurs. But what you then find is as your catheter comes up to the heart, instead of going into the right atrium, it'll often deviate off to the left and then join the left, uh, usually what's persisting left SVC up here. And I'll either go down the left SV to the coronary sinus or uh, it'll float around the anomena into the RA that way. And that's what, that's what happened in this case. And so it's called interrupt because there's no IVC connection into the uh, RA, the hepatic veins flow into the RA, uh, but the IVC then joins essentially with the azagus and then loops around. But having seen most patients, we see um, any of those venous approaches, usually just with a six French sheath uh, and this balloon wedge catheter or something like this will take you straight back uh, to the heart. And the idea of the balloon uh, at the tip there, uh, you'll see is you allow you to, to, to get into a wedge position, uh, which I'll explain, but basically it means it's, you're no longer transducing because it's an end hole catheter, you're no longer transducing or measuring the pressure in the PA, you're measuring through the pulmonary uh, vascular bed. The characteristic trace, so here presumably it's a left uh, brachial approach because you're coming back through the nominal SVC into the RA and so your initial pressure there you can see in the RA is normally about five to ten millimeters of mercury. Now sometimes these patients uh, you, you may have seen they get into the cath lab and they're dry as a chip because they've been fasting for however long uh, and, and that's why I try and run fluids where possible patients coming in for right heart caths unless they're really severe heart failure and they're brittle hemodynamics gentle IV fluids so at least they're in a uvolemic state, at least when you're doing the catheter study. Uh, so normally that should be five or 10 and there's a characteristic uh, uh, waveform usually uh, with an X and Y descent. And as you then push further, you then come to the RV, so you're crossing the tricuspid valve. And the RV um, uh, pressure waveform is seen there. So in theory, the RV EDP should be the same as your RA unless you've got tricuspid stenosis, in which case it'll be lower than the RA. Uh, and then the, we make a point here that your RVSP um, should be the same as your pulmonary artery systolic pressure here, unless you've got outflow of tract obstruction. And that's important to understand. And you'll see often see echo reports misreported. So you, you often see echo where you all know that you derive the RVSP on echo from your velocity across the tricuspid valve. So if you've got a three meters per second from the tricuspid valve, from the, um, across the tricuspid valve, so from the RV to the RA, that then tells you that the, so the gradient across that is three by three squared using Bernoulli's theorem. So that's uh, 36 millimeters of mercury. So all that tells you is that the RV is 36 millimeters higher of mercury higher than the RA. It's not an absolute, it's just that it is relative to the RA. And then you assume based on their JVP uh, or uh, 
uh, on the size of the IVC or an echo, what the RA is, and that allows you to, to derive an RVSP. Now, an RVSP will then equate with your pulmonary artery systolic pressure in most cases, unless you've got pulmonary stenosis. But I've seen a number of echoes reported as people having pulmonary hypertension, even when it's known they have congenital heart disease, that they have pulmonary hypertension, when in fact they don't, uh, what they have is pulmonary stenosis. So as you keep pushing the catheter, and usually once you're coming from above, this is quite easy, it just loops its way around. If, you, you know, if you're doing it femorally, you need to then try and torque it uh, up into the PA. As you cross the pulmonary valve, you'll then get a PA pressure. Now your PA pressure and your RV pressure are characteristically about a quarter uh, of systemic pressure normally. So you know, they, if you look at it there, it's usually it's like 30 on 15, for example, in the PA pressure with a mean under 20 thereabouts, under 20, 25. If your PA trace looks like an RV trace, that then suggests some, this person's got severe pulmonary regurgitation. So you've got a very low diastolic pressure in the same way that you get a wide pulse pressure uh, with aortic regurgitation. So if you get that wide pulse pressure, uh, that then suggests um, uh, severe pulmonary regurgitation. We characteristically see that in the tetralogy of fellow patients. Um, so I can talk about that in another talk about the pulmonary valve replacement in particular, but in tetralogy of fellow, um, the commonest valve lesion that, that these patients have, we're following with is um, pulmonary regurgitation. And then we decide based on the RV dimensions in particular, uh, the RV volume on MRIs, when to replace that. Now, as you push the right heart catheter into the wedge position, sometimes this is easy, sometimes it requires a bit of fiddling with the catheter, with the balloon inflated. So it's okay to have the balloon inflated when you're going through the heart. When you're pulling it back out, it always should be deflated. You should not cross a valve coming backwards uh, with the balloon inflated. Uh, in particular, tricuspid valve, you can easily tear cordial or cause problems. Most of the time you get away with it, but that's the same as most things you need to benefit from your variology. Most of the time you'll get away with it, but when you don't, you don't, it can cause a problem. So ideally pulling back the balloon should be down. And when you get into the wedge position, you then see an atrial trace again. And the waveform is often similar to the RA, but your LA pressure is always slightly higher than your uh, RA pressure. So this is, a, this is essentially, uh, this is what a wedge pressure is. Now, your, the best way to measure the wedge pressure usually is that you often see the respiratory variation. And with any of these pressures, there's an end expiration. Uh, so you get the patient to breathe in, out, hold, and then measure the pressure. And that's usually the most reliable question. Um, the... Uh, the, if you need to get a, a true LA pressure, you might just say, why don't you just measure the LA pressure? Well, a quarter of the population or 20, 25% of the population, if you've got a PFO, you can. You could easily just cross into the LA, being aware you don't want to leave the catheter there for too long because you'll get thrown by for me. So this is a surrogate for your LA pressure. Uh, and the uh, importance of that value can't be understated in someone that's got pulmonary hypertension because that's the key pressure that you need to define. If someone's got severe pulmonary hypertension or even moderately elevated pressures, the, the key measure is the wedge pressure and the relationship then of the pulmonary pressure to the wedge pressure. Because if it's low or normal, so under 15 millimeters of mercury, then that suggests that the elevated pulmonary pressures are not related and not secondary to left heart dysfunction, whether that be systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, valvular heart disease. It suggests you've either got primary pulmonary hypertension, so type 1, or lung-related type 3, um, uh, or, or, or it's CTEF uh, is, the, is the other way to look at it, uh, is the other differential. It's not type 2 uh, due to, um, in particular, diastolic dysfunction or mitral stenosis or anything left heart-related. Your wedge pressure, sometimes we're interested in the wedge pressure as it relates to the LVEDP, particularly with mitral stenosis. So in that case, you can have uh, a balloon, you can have this catheter sitting there in the wedge position. Uh, and then you can also have a second catheter from the arterial axis sitting in the ventricle. And you do simultaneous, simultaneous traces with the wedge and the LVEDP. And then the, in theory, the EDP should be the same as the LA. So therefore that should be the same as your wedge in most patients. 
if you've got an obstruction somewhere along the line, uh, and the classic being mitral stenosis, then your EDP will be low, lower than, you, than your wedge pressure. And you can actually then use that to calculate a mitral valve gradient and therefore a mitral valve uh, area. So that is the main role of the right heart cath, um, is one, looking at the relationship to the LA pressure in the setting of pulmonary uh, hypertension, and that allows you to calculate the pulmonary vascular resistance, which I'll talk about, uh, and also to detect and then quantify the size of an intracardiac shunt, because at each point where you're measuring pressures, you can also do oxygen sampling uh, and measure the oxygen level at that point. So just to reiterate that, if your pressures are elevated, if you've got a low uh, or normal wedge, it's likely uh, pulmonary issue, pulmonary issue, or at least a non-cardiac issue. If it's elevated, it's likely a left heart problem. Now, it's not always as simple as that, and sometimes it's a mixed picture. Uh, and in those patients where you suspect it's a mixed picture, often what I will do is arrange admission for diuresis, IV diuresis, and then repeat the right heart cath when you think you're in a uvolemic state. That, that it still can be difficult to manage, but this is, these are, this is really important when you try and, and you need to be vigilant about getting the pressures right as well and checking your zero, because you're, you're usually, you're making key decisions on these pressures, in particular, whether someone's a candidate for pulmonary vasodilators or whether you need to go and focus on a cardiac issue with diuretics and the like. You should all have a bit of an idea about how you calculate pulmonary vascular resistance. It's actually quite easy uh, once you know the formula. It's the mean PA pressure minus your LA pressure, which is your wedge pressure. And that is divided by QP. That's pulmonary blood flow. Now in most patients, or in patients without a shunt, QP will just be the cardiac output. But if you have a shunt, if you've got an ASD, VSD, PDA, or any other form of shunt, but they're the main causes of a shunt, QP, uh, uh, is higher than your cardiac output. And that's very important because otherwise you'll get the pulmonary vascular resistance wrong and it may, you may make the wrong decision about whether you close a defect or not. If you use cardiac output as opposed to QP and you may significantly overestimate your pulmonary vascular resistance. That's important to understand. How do you calculate cardiac output? So the same QP, QS. Generally, there's two methods, for the right heart cat. There's the fit oxygen method, and so that's using oxygen saturations. That's the commonest way. You can also use indicator dilution methods. So you can either use this green dye uh, or thermodilution. So the yellow, yellow balloon wedge catheter I showed you at the start, it's usually about seven French, and it's got a number of lumens, and you inject um, cooled saline through it, and then what the, the actual thermistor measures flow through the heart. So you're actually calculating the cardiac output that way, and it gives you these sort of traces. Usually, though, we're using the AVO2 difference. And so this is how we would do this. This is the FIC principle. To calculate QS, we're using the arterial saturation and then comparing it to the mixed venous. The mixed venous uh, is just a term for the combination of the SVC and IVC. And it's usually three SVC, one IVC divided by four. That's how you calculate mixed venous. And then once you've got your, um, uh, these two gases, you can use this equation to calculate QS or systemic blood flow. O2 consumption is usually an assumed value based on your body surface area. You plug in your, your outputs and then you're using this equation. Now you don't have to know this equation, the computer does it, but it's worth having an idea that you do need to plug in uh, your hemoglobin to develop your O2 contents. O2 content being different to your oxygen saturations. So that will give you your systemic blood flow. You can use the similar equation to then calculate your pulmonary blood flow. And you're doing this if you've got um, a shunt. If you've just got, if you've got no shunt, well then you don't need to do pulmonary blood flow because you, you, if all your sats are the same through, uh, you don't need to do that. You just use the other equation I showed you, this one, to tell you to work out cardiac output. But if you've got a shunt, then you should also calculate pulmonary uh, blood flow, and that's using the PA sat uh, and usually the pulmonary venous sat. Now, that's that may well be estimated, 
uh, unless you've crossed the PFO actually sample in the pulmonary vein, which sometimes we do, this is often estimated or assumed to be the same as aortic decay or saturation is normal. And then once you've done those calculations, it allows you to calculate the shunt size if there's one present. Uh, and then so you, what you're essentially doing uh, is calculating these sort of equations to try and work out what your QP, QS is. And you may sit there in meetings and see people when they're presented with an oxygen run and do it in their head. And, and this is the equation that they're using. They're just simply subtract, subtracting mixed venous from a, aortic for the systemic blood flow and then PA from uh, the pulmonary venous, uh, dividing the two and then coming up with uh, a QP, QS. And then if you're presented with a gas run, really what you're looking for is a step up for a change in oxygen saturations. And you're looking for an absolute change of 7%. So from 65 to 75, being a 10% absolute step up will be a significant jump. Now, sometimes you'll see they bump around a bit uh, and you're looking for a trend that actually makes sense. And that's the value of not leaving the lab, um, ideally. Now, you'll find if you're doing catheter studies in private labs, this can be a problem because they often send the oxygen sats and you get them, they send them off and you get them back half an hour later and then you realise they don't make sense. Whereas, at least at Royal Melbourne, we've got an oximeter and we can do the sampling in the lab. So you get the results before the end of the case and you can see if they make sense. And if they don't, you can repeat it. Um, the one that's usually I find wrong is the PA sat uh, because often people have been in a wedge position may have aspirated blood back a bit and then it's contaminated. And so I would always do put two pulmonary artery sats for that reason. Um, so I'll sample here, for example, and then pull it back to here. And then usually um, this is the more reliable one. So, but if you see a step up from SVC, IVC to the RA, so if these are 60, 60, and then this is 75, and then it's 75 and 75, that's what an ASD would look like. Differential would be partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Uh, so if you've got an anomalous vein coming in here, which is the commerce, the right upper pulmonary vein coming in here, uh, then you'll see a step up uh, as well in here, higher than the IVC and SVC. In general, if, as a rule of thumb, if you're just looking, screening for a shunt, you're not that sure, that you're, not, you're not really convinced that there is one, but you just want to rule it out. If you measure the SVC sat, high SVC, so up here, above the anomenate and the PA, and there's no difference, you've excluded all shunts. Because you've excluded an anomalous pulmonary vein, whether it's coming in here or whether it's coming on the left side into the anomenate, which is the other one, it is a vertical vein that comes up from the left lung and drains into the anomenate vein, which will drain into here. I've seen that a few times. So if you've got a high SVC and it doesn't make sense, it's probably an anomalous left vein. Um, but then, so I was saying, if you've got SVC and PA uh, the same, then you've excluded pulmonary venous, drainage issue, ASD, VSD, or P, uh, PDA. So a VSD, you'll see a step up from here into the RV. And then a PDA, you'll see the step up from RV out to here because your connection, your blood flow is coming in uh, at this point. So moving on to ASDs, the commonest ASD is the secundum ASD, which involves uh, the fossa rivalis. I'll talk about osteum primum defects uh, later, but they are the same as a partial AVSD. Sinus venosus defects technically are not ASDs. So you shouldn't really refer to them as ASDs. They're defects here of the actual great veins, just as you enter the atrium. Usually they're associated with partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. The commonest being an anomalous right upper vein coming into the SVC. And another form of defect, which I'll touch on, is the coronary sinus defect. So this is a secundum ASD. Uh, an important point to, to, to know about ASDs is that they're a dynamic shunt. And by that, I mean they worsen as you get older. And that's simply because, as I said, your LA pressure is usually slightly higher than your right atrial pressure. As you get older and you develop diastolic dysfunction, your LA pressure goes up, so you get more shunting across it. That's as distinct from a partial anomalous pulmonary vein as it also causes a left to right shunt, that is a fixed shunt. And that's important to understand is that if you, found, if you have someone, and we find this now when people are getting CTs more and more uh, for other reasons, and they have an incidental finding of a, a partial anomalous pulmonary vein connection, uh, if there's no other defect, 
and the, the shunt from that, because it'll cause electrolyte shunt is 1.3 to 1, 1.4 to 1, you can forget about it because it's not going to cause a problem. It's not going to get worse with age. But if you have a small ASD, that may change with age. You may get more shunting. 10% are multiple, 10% have associated partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection, and 10%, if they're unrepaired, will go on to Eisenmenger syndrome. It's worth an idea having a bit of an understanding of the rims. Classically, we talk about aortic uh, and posterior, so that's in the short axis here. No aortic rim here, this is the posterior rim. Uh, so that's at 45 on the TOE. Then you come around to nine, uh, to your bicable view uh, on your uh, TOE, and you have SVC uh, and IVC, so that's looking down through here. And then you come around back around to zero and you look at the AV valve rim. So your AV valve, uh, and then usually we prefer that is the superior rim, but usually this is the AV valve rim. We'll usually do a TOE as workup, and usually beforehand to characterize the ASD and decide if we think it's closable. Uh, if you don't see all four pulmonary veins, and even if you do sometimes, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have anomalous veins because you can sometimes you have five veins, for example, but if you don't see all four veins and you're not convinced, then I would often do a CT or MRI to, to make sure the anatomy is otherwise as advertised. Catheterization we usually do at the time of, of closure. Sometimes we do exercise testing, in particular if there's elevated pulmonary pressures and we're worried about desaturation. Uh, usually this is what we get with a TOE. More and more we're starting to use 3D TOE to get an idea of the, the anatomy. Uh, I think what is hopefully uh, coming more and more is this, these types of CT reconstructions. This is a, um, a, a model I actually got made, but this is the virtual model and you can appreciate how clear the anatomy is here and in particular how the, the issue with the deficient aortic rim uh, and, and, and the fact that it's deficient along a long, quite a long segment there. So this device would actually have to splay up uh, on the aorta and you have to be careful with erosion. Uh, MRI on fast imaging can sometimes uh, be useful. I don't use it that much, but there are papers that are describing its use in terms of defect, it's defining the actual defect and, and detecting, on, uh, detecting other defects. When do we close ASDs? The general indication is symptoms attributable to the ASD uh, with a hemodynamically significant shunt. But if you don't have any symptoms and you see, and that's defined by RV and margin. So an ASD loads the right heart. So left to right shunt at the level of the atrium causing right heart enlargement. If you have no symptoms and you've got a blown out RV, uh, then that would be an indication enough. And often when you find when you close it, people feel better anyway. Paradoxical embolism, we usually think about in the context of PFOs, uh, but certainly you can see it can be a motor presentation of an ASD and it would be an indication of the close, <laughs> particularly if you've got a device inside you. They are a high risk group with whether they've got a pace, uh, pacemaker ICD. So whether it's a PFO or ASD, thrombus formation on the leads can lead to paradoxical embolism. Uh, and another indication of close would be the platelet near or third syndrome. Ideally, your PA pressures are less than 50% systemic pressure and yeah, there's no desaturation with, with exercise. And there's a number of proven benefits with ASD closure. Functional capacity improves, you're preventing onset of atrial arrhythmias, preventing pulmonary hypertension, RV dysfunction, paradoxical embolism. Hasn't yet been clearly established that there's, there's a mortality benefit. You don't want to close when there's evidence of Eisenmenger physiology. That means that your systemic, your PA pressures are approaching systemic pressure. And it's true Eisenmenger when you actually get reversal of shunting because you've had left to right shunting. And it's less common with ASDs unless they're huge. It's more common with BSDs and PDAs. But any large left to right shunt with time will, will load, load the pulmonary circulation, cause damage to the pulmonary vascular to drive up your pulmonary pressures and then eventually you get reversal of shunting. If you close a defect in that instance, because you're all told, no, Eisenmenger, you can't close it. Well, what actually happens? Well, you may precipitate a hemodynamic collapse if, if they're reliant somewhat on that shunt for systemic flow. Because of so the pulmonary pressures and the pulmonary circulations so poor or without that pop-off valve, if you like, they can't then have forward flow, forward systemic flow and you get hemodynamic collapse. But 
they may survive it. You may close the ASD or the BSD or PDA and they survive it because this applies to any shunt. What you then do is convert them to a worse phenotype. You convert them to a primary pulmonary hypertension phenotype and they do worse. They were a worse prognosis than, prognosis than actualized in this. The other, in, the other time you wouldn't close is someone with a small defect. We usually talk, so talk about under 10 millimeters with a non-significant shunt. As I mentioned though, they have a dynamic shunt. And so ideally you would monitor them with an echo every two to three years to make sure they're not start slowly dilating their RV, which would be an indication to close or developing pulmonary hypertension. So this, for example, is someone I saw recently, 53. She was actually found to have an ASD 20 years ago during pregnancy with a soft murmur, no symptoms at all. And she's generally got a good exercise capacity demonstrated on a stress test. She's got a small defect, eight by 10 millimeters, RV's normal size. She's had a cath and then the QPQS is under 1.5 to one, pulmonary pressures are normal. So I haven't closed this, but I'm not discharging her or repeat an echo uh, in a few years. If we're gonna close it, we've got two um, main devices. There's the, the commonest we use is the AMPLAT susceptible occluder, night and old wire mesh dacron patches, and we talk about the size of the device referring to the waist. You can use um, uh, non-self-centering devices. These are self-centering, non-self-centering devices, such as the gore occluder, but you can only close a defect half as big as the disc, because it makes sense. You've only got a waist in there that will center on one side. And so you need to, you can only co really co um, cover small defects. This is quite a nice device, mainly because of the risk of ero erosion is a lot lower with it. And this is a newer gore septal occluder designed for ASDs that is self-centering that's, that's uh, available in Australia very shortly. This is a case 45, short of breath, dilated RV. You can see the saturations uh, there, clearly a step up from your mixed venous to your PA. And I can tell you that was at the atrial level um, uh, of 15. So this is a significant shunt. PA pressure, the mean is elevated, the wedge is low. So there's a trans uh, pulmonary gradient, uh, there is 25. Using those calculations I showed you earlier, 7.4 is the QP. Uh, QS is 3.7. So QPS is two to one. The pulmonary vascular resistance is normal. 35 minus 10 divided by QP, not divided by QS, as, which is the cardiac output, it's by QP. As you can see, if you divide it by QS, you'd end up with a high pulmonary vascular resistance. You may then have concerns about closing this. You can see there's that bridge of tissue there as well. So what we do, um, this was done with intracardiac echo. Uh, the catheter here is from the RA across the defect. There's the waist. This is the LA and that wires in the pulmonary vein. This was a 12 millimeter waist. And with that band of tissue, I actually performed a septostomy by just keeping on inflating this balloon, a 34 millimeter sizing balloon, to almost coalesce the defects. Uh, and that then allows closure with a single device. Uh, and that, that's the result there, no residual shunting. Sometimes the two defects can be remote from one another. So you've got to close each other separately uh, and balloon size both of them uh, separately and, and then deliver the devices. And ideally you do them um, sequentially. You don't, uh, you don't close one and then cross, you, you deliver them together because there can be a bit of interaction uh, with the devices. This is an interesting case we had recently and this is a pretty uncommon scenario, but we, at Royal Melbourne we have a number of congenital patients coming through and this lady um, had a tussing bing anomaly. So what that is, is I'll talk more about that in the complex talk, but double out that right ventricle with, and double out that right ventricle has four types based on where the BSD is. Hers was what's called a subarterial BSD. So it's up under the pulmonary and aortic valve. And classically you repair that with an arterial switch operation. She had a stroke and was found to have this small residual uh, ASD. And as we were looking, we're about to close this just like you would a PFO. It's quite a small ASD, almost a PFO. And then we saw that there's this here. And if you then scroll around on the TOE, you can see that there's this structure running right where the device is gonna sit. And this was actually, I hadn't planned on shooting a coroner's, but it does show why it may be useful, particularly in congenital patients who often have abnormal other things going on. Um, the value of them looking uh, at um, her coronaries, because you can see here there's this retroactive course of the circumflex, 
Uh, and then it looks like the balloon's a fair way away, but if this is the gore septal occluder and I deploy that, you can see how close it is here on the angiogram and on the TOE. So I elected not to let that device go because it actually, I didn't see compression in the coronary, but I was concerned enough that as she gets older, you may see change in aortic dimensions um, that you may actually get uh, compression of that coronary. So it's always just worth being keeping in mind. That's been described as well as an issue with the retro aortic circumflex. In that lady, she, she's got some other valve issues that may require um, surgery at some point, so she'll get it closed uh, at that point. In terms of ASD closure, uh, fortunately, these issues are very infrequent. The things we worry about are embolization and erosion. Embolization, this is a case 50 year old, secundum ASD, quite a hypermobile septum. You can see the defects not actually that big. And I balloon sized it at about 17. We talk about stop flow. Usually I just inflate the balloon until you've got a waste and then you, you, it'll look like this. And that's what I did here. And then in theory, you're meant to slowly let down the balloon and the stop flow stops you oversizing it because you let it, you, you stop flow is once you start getting restoration of flow, you put a couple of mils back in and you measure the waste. This measured 17, so I took an 18 millimeter device. And I must say, when I look at this in retrospect, uh, it just doesn't look quite big enough. But nonetheless, we thought it was fairly stable. Uh, and I let go and it looks pretty stable there. Unfortunately, someone came running to me the next day with an x-ray that looked like this. And so you'll appreciate here's the heart. And this is not the heart. And so this is not where you want your device to be. And so this is sitting uh, in the aorta. So this patient had embolized the device. And if you go back through the telemetry, it's quite interesting. At about 2 a.m., there was a ventricular run that hadn't necessarily been picked up on. But I think that was probably when the device kicked out and then moved uh, through the heart to the aorta. And it's just lodged here. Um, the patient was otherwise asymptomatic and I managed to retrieve it. So just put a 12 French sheath uh, in the femoral vein and then used a, a gooseneck snare to grip one of the, um, uh, the eyelets and then pulled it into that. And so that was an uneventful um, removal of the device. Relatively straightforward and an aortogram to prove, to prove uh, no damage done. So then I just I went back and then actually sized it. And I've got a slightly bigger dimension this time. Now the question is, did I undersize it on the first time? Or um, sometimes what's been described is the device with floppy septums can actually split, lead to split in the septum and the septum actually, the hole actually gets bigger. But I, nonetheless, in any case, this device is, sits, is sitting much uh, nicer and that, that was very stable. Um, so no harm done for that patient other than egg on my face with an embolization. I hope it doesn't happen again. Uh, why does it happen? Usually inadequate wounds with undersized devices. And, and I think this mobile anatomy, mobile septum um, may well be contributing to that. Most occur within 24 hours. Uh, and most, if they do embolize, go to the LA or to the aorta. And most can be retrieved percutaneously. The main worry with these devices, and this would be a reason why, if I think there's a high risk of this happening, the reason why you'd send for surgery is this worry about erosion. And inc an incident is estimated to be 0.1%, and it should be in your consent for all of these patients. Uh, and this is a classic scenario. It either presents with hemodynamic collapse with tamponade, or uh, as in this case, um, uh, and a, a fistula forming between the aorta uh, and the left atrium. Uh, and that patient then required, that occurred at three months, required revision of surgery. These are a lot of the cases as, as this initial report reported uh, back to AGA as it was then or Amplatz. And you can see most erosions are happening early, but a number aren't happening late. Most are presenting with tamponade, so very unwell with this. And that's why it needs to be part of your consent, in particular to say, this is a risk, but also if you're suddenly feeling unwell, get yourself into a hospital because it may be a rescuable situation. But what's interesting is if you've plotted out all the device sizes here, it's not just with large defects. It's happening with smaller uh, sizes uh, as well. And there's a thought that perhaps using oversized devices for that defect may be contributing to it. Uh, and most have a deficient aortic 
uh, and superior rim. And that led the FDA back then to say that you shouldn't close those with deficient aortic rims. Now that's been with revoked. So the ones that you don't want to close definitely are the ones with absence or deficient IVC posterior rims, because they're the ones that are going to embolize on you. The aortic and superior rim, we are happy to close in many situations, as long as, and I'll show a picture, you don't have indentation uh, of the aorta. And so this is what you don't want to see. So the risk factors are here. Device oversizing, so more than two millimeter upsize from your balloon stretch diameter. So if it measures 28 and you go 32, you're probably pushing it a little bit. Also, if your balloon size diameter is bigger, a lot bigger than the static diameter. That means when you get it there on the TOE, you measure it and it's 14 millimeters and you balloon it up and it becomes 28 millimeters. That just means you've got a really floppy septum that you're stretching up and that, then you're wedging a device in, you may well increase erosion. But if you get this appearance, this is good, this is okay. Splaying is okay, indenting is bad. This sort of movement is bad as well. I mentioned, if you saw it, you might have noticed in that list of um, de uh, device or defects, sorry, device sizes previously, 26 millimeter was overrepresented. And there's a thought at, at certain points with the AMPLATS of devices at least, so 24 to 26 is one, the, the wire thick, the wire used is thicker, it changes over. So 20, 22, 24 all have the same thickness wire, then 26, 28, 32 all have a slightly thicker one. And because the 26 is smaller than 30, 32, 34, the thought is that it's more compact and maybe uh, a higher radial strength, if you like, and maybe that's associated uh, with higher erosion. So recommendations to avoid erosion, avoid overstretching, um, and that's where this stop flow diameter came from. And then cl close follow-up of those at high risk. So if you're really oversized, it compared to what the native, you know, the unstretched diameter is. Clearly, if you see a small effusion at 24 hours, we need to keep a close eye on them if there's de de deformation of the aortic root. We need to be educating the patients. Surgery uh, for ASD was first performed in 1953 and is well established uh, as a good option for these patients. It's one of the easiest cardiac surgery operations that are done. Minimal invasive approaches are feasible. Those patients um, often do get a lot of pain afterwards, but I've had a few patients who had minimal invasive approaches. Operative mortality though is one to 3%. There's a limited number of studies. They're just small observational studies comparing the two device versus surgery that is. Similar mortality, no difference in efficacy, uh, but a different complication profile. So if you have a look at some studies here, um, the uh, difference largely is in the complication profile. Surgery, higher bleeding rate and need for redo surgery device, higher embolization rate. And if you look here in this other study, which is a multi-center US study published in 2002, the, the difference is then surgery, 5% major complication rate, tamponade, pulmonary edema, redo surgery, infection, whereas device was mainly embolization, pacemaker need in, in a handful. Uh, but one study suggested slightly higher re-intervention rate with uh, devices. In general, we are closing most with devices currently unless they're too large or, as I said, deficient IVC, AV valve rooms, high risk of embolization, or you just look at it and you think, now that's high risk of erosion. So particularly younger people, 20, 30 year olds, if I'm wedging, a, going to be putting a really big device in and you know, you're worried that it's going to be up on the roof of the atrium and on the aorta, I'll have a chat with them and say, I can try and wedge a device in here. And sometimes that we do, we try and put it in and you put it in, it looks huge, it's too big for the atrium. And you, no, this isn't right. I think you should just have a straightforward operation, which is gonna last you for the rest of your life. And we don't have to stress every time we follow you up, you can have an erosion. If they're older, then you may, you know, there's 50, 60, 70, you may then say, well, you know, then, it's worth taking on some risk to avoid an operation at that point, unless they need it for another indication. The other indication to look for may be TR. So traditionally, if we've seen moderate or more tricuspid regurgitation, there, there's some data that suggests those patients will do better with tricuspid annuloplasty. Having said that, I've just included a study here where you do actually see some improvement in TR severity anyway, after the device closure. Some challenging subsets or groups, 
if you've got pulmonary hypertension, it's not yet eyes and mangas, but it's it's more than you know, it's more than moderate. You're getting there with it. If you've still got a net left to right shunt, or you've got evidence of pulmonary PA reactivity, it's not unreasonable to this to, to pursue this treat and close model. So you use vasodilators or diuretics pre-closure, trying to bring the pressures down. LV dysfunction, you've got to be careful whether it's systolic or diastolic. If you've got a really high wedge pressure, you've got to be careful that when you close it, you don't precipitate pulmonary edema. Because if you think about it, you close the ASD, all of a sudden your, your, your LA pressures rise suddenly uh, and, and you can then precipitate heart failure. So usually diuresis prior is enough, but it's sometimes we talk about fenestrating the device. I've never done that, but it has been described where people deliberately inflate a balloon in the device to leave a little hole. Coexisting uh, pulmonary veins, I told you that's 10%. Um, you can use, that doesn't always mean you need surgery. Uh, you can decide just to close the secundum ASD and leave them with the small, with the, the anomalous vein, particularly if it's just a right upper coming in to the SVC, you might just leave that as a residual fixed left to right shunt, but you close the ASD. If someone has arrhythmias, always think about, and then there's a number of reasons why these patients get arrhythmias. I've listed them here. Um, they get both geometric, geometric remodeling and electrical remodeling that can predispose them to arrhythmias, particularly if you get older. And if you close someone over the age of 40, there's a high chance they'll have ongoing arrhythmias. Um, but if they have had arrhythmias, ideally I would get an EP person involved first and give them the option of performing an AF ablation if, they, if it is AF, uh, and even, even waiting for a time, because this is a, um, uh, sorry, there was another case I was gonna show, but you can often wait for a period of time to wait for recurrence, because they may then wanna do a redo, because this is the problem. Once you put a device in, it's very hard for the EP guys to get into the left atrium. It's certainly possible, uh, but it's just, it just harder. If, if the device is small under 26 millimeters, often you can just go in behind it. Uh, but otherwise you're talking about puncturing through it and actually ballooning it up or going, or going retrograde. Uh, nickel allergy, uh, I won't say much about this, but there are case reports of patients developing significant chest pain, shortness of breath, migraine post device that has improved with device removal and it's been postulated that it might represent nickel allergy. This is a really gray area and, and quite difficult. Certainly if a patient brings up the fact they've got nickel allergy, I will be more wary. If they were borderline surgery, that would probably sway me to send them for surgery. If they are otherwise, I'd think about using the gore device because in theory that releases a lot less nickel than the amplatzer device. But what's interesting is some centers routinely screen for this um, if there's any possibility based on jewelry reactions and that sort of thing and refer for surgery if other are abnormal. Others never screen and never, ha never had to take out a, a device. What about some of those other ASDs uh, I showed you? Coronary sinus defects, um, typically, uh, well, they'll cause a left to right shunt and the, the shunting actually is from the LA into the CS and this is what an unroofed CS looks like. So you've got your coronary sinus running down here. The DP, the flow goes LA into the sinus and then out to the RA, and that's how you get a left to right shunt. Most of the time, these will go for surgery. There have been case reports of closing the actual defect in the coronary sinus with a small plug. Most reports, though, and I did one of these when I was a fellow in, in Canada, um, where you block off the coronary sinus at its origin. Sounds crazy, but basically what you're doing is just leaving a small obligate left to right shunt from the coronary sinus into the left atrium. And so you get some, sorry, sorry, left to right, it's right to left because it's deoxygenated blood from the heart just going into the left atrium. So their saturations might run, you know, at, at uh, 94, 95%, but that's fine. You've got rid of the left to right uh, shunt, but usually that, that'd be patients who aren't suitable for surgery. Sinus venosis defects, I'll play this CT to show you what a sinus venosis defect is. Uh, but basically it's a connection then up here where the SVC is meant to be coming in. This is the sinus venosis defect up at this level here, often associated with anomalous pulmonary veins. Usually these patients are referred for surgery and the surgery uh, entails baffling the pulmonary venous flow here across into the left atrium. And then by closing that, you get the SVC flow then coming in uh, separately. 
uh, issues that they can have. They can have a baffle leak, they can develop SVC stenosis, pulmonary vein stenosis, or sinus node dys dysfunction. So you should monitor them for pulmonary hypertension. They're more likely than the sequinomase D to get late pulmonary hypertension, usually due to the degree of shunting and more likely to develop arrhythmias, whether it be tachy arrhythmias, atrial arrhythmias, or sinus node dysfunction. This is quite exciting and, I, and I'd be keen to explore this if, I, if we have a patient come through with a sinus venosis defect, but this group has, has published uh, this year have had a success using a series or just one large covered stent that they flare into the right atrium. So it closes the defect like that and then what you rely on, and you have to demonstrate that it's possible through a number of um, uh, tests at the time, that the pulmonary venous flow will then run behind uh, into the left atrium. So we'll see, see what happens with that. Uh, moving on to AV septal defects. Now these are quite poorly understood, so I'll spend a bit of time on this. As opposed to AV canal, they're the same as AV canal defects rather, and it's the same as the endocardial cushion defect. This is your AV septum. And this is why your tricuspid valve is offset relative to your mitral valve. If it's offset by more than eight millimetres per metre squared, as an index distance, that is Epstein's. Uh, most of the time though, it's offset by a few millimetres and because of the AAV septum. Now this is normal anatomy. Mitral, tricuspid, and you've got the, the, the trigones in here um, and the AV septum. Aorta sits in front and is wedged between the two and then the pulmonary valve sits out further in front of that. Uh, and there's an infundibulum connecting the right heart out to the pulmonary vein, whereas you've got aortomitral continuity between the aorta and mitral valves. So that's important to understand. The aortic valve doesn't have an infundibulum because it's continuous with the anterior mitral, but the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary are disconnected because you've got the RV infundibulum. If you've got an AV septal defect, whether it's partial or complete, you do not have this system, this setup. You've got a common AV valve, and this is how a common AV valve looks like. Um, I'm sure if I asked most of you to draw a common AV valve, you'd struggle uh, if you haven't done a congenital fellowship. Uh, certainly, I didn't know about this before I'd um, done my fellowship in Canada, but this is what it looks like. Superior bridging, inferior bridging leaflets uh, on the right, yeah, have the right anterior superior and right inferior leaflet, and then on the left, you've got the mural leaflet. If you've got a common AV valve, uh, so if you have complete AV septal defect, you have this common AV valve, and that valve is basically just floating, opening and closing, but floating. And you have atrial level shunting and ventricular level shunting. If this AV, this common AV valve is adherent to the ventricular crest, that is a partial AVSD. So this is an ostium primum or partial AVSD. Same thing, you just, that's where you have the, the, the shunting, uh, but you have an abnormal valve. And so you, this, is, this is the type of valve that you have. It's a common ring. The valves will be on the same plane. And in particular, you have this, which is a cleft. And it really is just the gap between the bridging leaflets, but it's, that's the so-called true uh, cleft. So to reiterate that, complete AVSD, atrial and ventricular level shunting, partial AVSD is all the same, except for the fact you, you have your, your bridging leaflets are adherent to the ventricular crest, crest rather. So features of AVSD, you have abnormal AV valves. They're not, this is one condition where you talk about left AV valve, right AV valve. The other one being double and left ventricle as a single ventricle. All the others, you should be able to say mitral and tricuspid, people should know what you're talking about. Uh, but this is where they're not a mitral and it's not a tricuspid. It's a left AV valve and a right, right AV valve. It drives me crazy when you see uh, echo people report this and, and then don't, don't know what they're looking at uh, because it's actually not a mitral tricuspid. It's left AV valve, right AV valve. And they're on the same plane. And that makes sense that they're on the same plane because you don't have the AV septum. They've usually got left axis deviation and they have this issue of the inlet. There's an MRI showing that they're on the same plane and you have inlet outlet disproportion. What that means is the distance from the apex to the AV valve is less than the apex to the aortic valve. And so you have this so-called gooseneck uh, deformity. And this is often what it looks like. And so you almost have an infundibulum of the LV outflow tract. 
Um, surgery uh, is usually what's required uh, for these patients uh, and they repair the AV valve, the left AV valve, often suture close that cleft, which is between the bridging leaflets and then patch the defect. They need ongoing follow-up for AV valve regurgitation, outflow tract obstruction uh, or heart block. Now, why this is important is this scenario. And so always keep an eye out for someone, if you're referred to someone who has severe MR and they, have, they give a history in childhood of ASD surgery and mitral valve repair. And, I, and I've seen this a couple of times. And actually, if you think about it, the diagnosis really is osteoprimum or partial AVSD with repair of the regurgitant left AV valve. And that's what they've had before. And now their problem is that they've just developed left AV valve regurgitation. Now, why does it really matter? They're going to go for surgery anyway. Well, you need to choose your surgeon correct, carefully because if you're not a, a well-trained congenital surgeon who doesn't know their way around uh, um, these scenarios, you can really cause a lot of trouble, particularly if you insert an oversized mechanical mitral valve. You get this catastrophic risk of LVOT obstruction, and, that, and that's been uh, described. So as long as the surgeons or the, you need, what you need usually is the cardiologist to pick it and then, and then uh, work with the surgeon saying, look, this is just not normal anatomy. Whilst you're gonna go in and do a valve replacement, you just need to be careful with this and you're unlikely to get away with a repair uh, in most, most scenarios. Platypnea near orthodeoxia syndrome, I've mentioned a few times. This is an interesting condition where you get shortness of breath hypoxia with sitting or standing from a recumbent position. Two components are required. You need either an ASD or a PFO, an anatomic component, and then you need a functional component. And what that means is something is changed in that patient that has changed the axis of the heart. And usually it changes such that the IVC flow is now directed straight at your interatrial defect. Constriction can do it. Uh, where I was working in Canada, they were a big lung surgery unit and the classic scenario was a pneumonectomy. So, post-surgery, these patients would be hypoxic trying to work out what was going on and it was because there was an access shift uh, and they had a, a PFO that wasn't causing a problem previously and now it was. Abdominal issues, cirrhosis societies and ILS or aortic aneurysms, so vascular issues or unfolding aorta can do it. It's not a pressure phenomenon, uh, it's just flow straight at the septum and classically they have this, this is an ice image, they have this highly unusual interatrial septum. Uh, and you can see here with the device closed uh, in place that the cable flow that's often quite horizontal would have been directed straight at that. This is a lady recently 79, short of breath, particularly when she stood up and sung in church. Uh, all her tests fitted more with an ischemic cardiomyopathy. She got a stent to her right, didn't make any difference. And on the ward, uh, we found that she was intermittently profoundly hypoxic. And there was this theory going around at the time uh, from one of, um, from someone else, uh, uh, that, that there was, because she had had no LED yet revascularized and she had an apenetic apex, that she was transient the LED ischemic, LED ischemia driving up her pressures leading to heart failure. Uh, and then one of the cardiologists then did a bubble study, said, hang on, this is not right, there must be a shunt, and it was strongly positive. Uh, and what she actually had was this, this is her same sort of, see, you see that really unusual septum, and she had just an unfolded aorta uh, with, and I can go back, I've got the CT here. Uh, this is our unusual shape of her aorta and this is the, the unusual shape of the septum and the RA was almost uh, compressed. And then we're just with the standard PFO occluder, we occluded that and then she, had, she didn't have any more problems. Her symptoms were fixed. She still gets a bit short of breath from her cardiomyopathy, but she's certainly not getting that issue with uh, profound hypoxia. So if you look at this oximetry or this um, uh, gas run, the SATs increase in the ventricle and then they're carried out. So this is a VSD. So types of VSDs, um, I remember finding this very confusing, but simply put, think about VSDs as being four types. The commonest is membranous. It's the same as perimembranous. Same thing, it sits here under the aortic valve uh, and the tricusp near the tricuspid valve. Subarterial is the same as subpulmonary, double committed, juxtaarterial, outlet, supercrystal. They're all the same thing, and it just means your defect is over here under the pulmonary and aortic valves. Muscular is easy to, to understand, uh, and the AV canal type we've just talked about is the same as your complete uh, AVSD. 
This is where you, um, this is the typically where the membranous uh, VSDs sit here with the tricuspid, and this is the membranous septum underneath, underneath the uh, aortic cusp. Membranous VSDs classically are associated with either subaortic stenosis, so they often get a subaortic ridge, aortic regurgitation, and the other peculiar condition is double chamber right ventricle, where you get this proliferation of muscle bundles in the RV outflow tract. And so you get a high RVSP uh, and with a normal pulmonary pressures and it's an RVOT obstruction, but it's called double chamber right ventricle, classically associated with membranous uh, VSDs. A membranous VSD is here. This is a transthoracic right ventricle, RA right ventricle PA. Membranous VSD here, subarterial, or this, this one with all these other names is over here at two o'clock, whereas membranous is at 10 o'clock. If Someone is repaired in the first two years of life. Usually they're asymptomatic with uh, excellent outcome. If someone's repaired at five years of age, and it's always worth asking your patients if they've had a VSD closed, if it was repaired after two years, so five, for example, six, they can have late LV dysfunction or pulmonary hypertension. VSDs can just close on their own. In adults, usually present either with a murmur or heart failure. Remember, a VSD load, loads the LV, not the RV. And the way I think about it is the blood's going across in systole. That then doesn't affect the RV. It goes to the pulmonary circulation and the first chamber that sees it actually is the LV. We talk about restrictive or non-restrictive. It's quite, not quite as simple as that, but if it's non-restrictive and line at low velocity flow, um, then you're usually going to end up with Eisenmengers if it's uncorrected. Restrictive just means a high velocity jet, four or five meters a second, and usually that range of troubles. The reason to close is symptoms attributable to the VSD with LV overload, not RV, LV overload with a high QPQS, and again, not without severe pulmonary hypertension. Device occlusion is good for these, not so much membranous. We haven't yet got a device that's good for the membranous VSDs. You tend to get complete half block, tricuspid valve issues, aortic regurgitation. So muscular VSDs, very good, post-surgical good, post-infarct, there's a specific device. So this is an example of a post-surgical VSD, LV, RV, there's the VSD. To close these, the easiest way, and it looks quite complex here, is to cross from the aorta to the LV, cross over to the RV and then go out to the PA with your wire, snare the wire in the PA. So now you've got this wire going all the way through. You've snared it and then you bring it out through the femoral vein. So then you, you've got a wire that goes up from the femoral artery through the heart and then out to the femoral vein. Then you turn around and then deliver the device from the venous side. It's just difficult to cross from the venous side is the issue uh, with the wire. And then that's a muscular VSD there sitting in place. Post-infarct VSDs is an interesting subject. I reviewed this recently with my mentor uh, from um, Canada, Eric Horlick. We published this in Euro Intervention. There are devices that are, used, uh, that are developed for post-infarct VSDs with reasonably high technical success rate and low complication rate. The problem is if they're performed in the acute setting, there's a really high in-hospital mortality rate. But the long-term outcomes from device closure are actually pretty good if someone's treated subacutely, and usually that's because these patients have selected themselves out and you've got more stable margins. When we looked at it all, we came up with the conclusion that basically surgery is probably better up front for these patients, irrespective of their hemodynamic status. And this is the issue, is trying to get someone to commit to taking on these high-risk patients. Um, and so that's the preferred way. And then devices are also very good if you get a patch leak. So say you get a patch that pulls away because of the necrotic margins, you can then go and close that with a device. And that's quite a, a good result, or can yield quite a good result. Here's a post-infarct DSD closed with this device here. And you can see there's often quite a serpiginous channel through there. That device is under a lot of tension. The next um, uh, shunt to talk about is a PDA. So here you're seeing the step up from the RV to the PA. And this is because you're getting blood flow in here. Most of the time, these patients are either don't have any symptoms, but are found to have a continuous murmur, or they're presented with heart failure. And a PDA, like a VSD, loads the LV as well. The continuous murmur occurs because your systolic pressure in the aorta is always higher than your PA systolic pressure unless you've developed Eisenmengers. 
uh, and your diastolic pressure is also higher than, the, than your PA pressure. So that's why it's continuous forward flow. You close a PDA if there's left chamber enlargement or pulmonary hypertension without yet developing eyes and mangas. Um, if they've had previous infection, there's 10% lifetime risk of developing infection of this. Or basically, if you can hear a continuous murmur, we say, because it's such a simple defect to close, and we can close most of these with devices, because it's so simple and straightforward to close, we would close pretty much all that are audible to remove the risk of long-term complications, in particular end arteritis, 10% lifetime risk. If you can't hear it, there's no point closing it, is a general rule of thumb. Uh, and if they've got eyes and mangas, um, you shouldn't close it. And a word about that, remember, if someone has eyes and mangas syndrome from PDA, they may actually have reasonable sats in their arms, in their hands. They might have sats like high 80s, 90s, and then have 60 in their feet because of this differential cyanosis. Because you can think about it, the, the blue blood is crossing over after your, your cerebral vessels. 22-year-old murmur, LV is dilated. There's this continuous flow. This is classically what you see, continuous flow into the PA uh, here. And this is what the aortogram looks like. There's the PDA here with flow into the pulmonary artery. So we typically close these from the venous aspects. So you, you cross from the PA and you just need to know where to point the catheter. Can be a bit fiddly. Sometimes you need to cross from the aorta and snare it in the PA and then create the rail like we did with the VST. And most of the time you use it this, this for the single disc uh, device and you can see there that that's sitting there quite nicely and has blocked off the flow. That's quite an unusual long segment uh, PDA. Uh, I do a bit of work with um, East Timor heart funds uh, and this is a patient who was referred over from East Timor with severe heart failure. She was a 30 year old nurse who ran into trouble with heart failure during pregnancy. And she had this huge window like PDA uh, you can see here, this is what the CT look like. Um, this is the aorta PA. You can see she's got a 14 millimeter window there between the uh, PDA and the aorta. So this is so-called type B or window-like uh, PDAs. So she came forward for closure. She had systemic pulmonary pressures, pretty much. Near systemic, her, her pressure was 80 from memory. That was 71.25. Her LA pressure is low. So you'd look at that and think, She's got a huge, uh, she's got severe pulmonary hypertension. She must nearly be Eisenmengers. But interestingly, when you did her calculations and you plugged in her QP, because she had such a huge left to right shunt still, for some reason she hadn't yet developed Eisenmengers, the pulmonary vascular resistance came out as low. Because even though there was this huge difference between the PA, the mean PA and the wedge, the QP was high, so PVR is low. And you can see it's actually hard because there's so much flow across it and so big to actually work out what's going on. So I actually balloon sized this, put a wire across to, to really work out how big it was. And it was too big for a normal um, AD Amplex adductor cluder. So I ended up using the biggest muscular VSD device that we had. And this is it here, um, which has been uh, deployed. And that was actually fairly straightforward to deliver. And that's the uh, 18 millimeter muscular VSD device. And you can see there's still a bit of flow across there and she certainly did hemolyze for a while, uh, but that then settled down and she's now back at work uh, in East Timor. I recently published uh, the results from Toronto on this, 140 cases, uh, mostly this, the type A duct, uh, most anti-grade wire passage, that means from the venous aspect, so 21% we had to snare from the aorta. High procedural success rate, most of them using the Amplats of duct one uh, uh, colluder. Uh, ADO1 occluder uh, without any major complications. And most of the time uh, it's, there's resi minimal residual shunting. So this is really quite a straightforward uh, and um, uh, effective uh, method for closing defects. So rarely do people need um, surgery these days. And in the last minute or two, just to talk about Eisenmenger syndrome, and this is the type of SAT run you'd see. It's the same through this level, um, all through the right heart. And you, they've given you the pulmonary vein sat there and then the, the uh, LA sat's lower. So you're getting flow, blue blood coming in at an atrial level. So this is an ASD with reversal of flow contributing to Eisenmenger. And this is, the, this is the sequence that I've touched on. It's more likely to happen with a PDA or VSD than an ASD, but it's due to an uncorrected large left to right shunt leading to this endothelial dysfunction, increasing your PBR and then you get reversal of shunting.
these patients develop erythrocytosis. It's not polycythemia, it's erythrocytosis because it's selective for the, the, the hemoglobin only. They can get hyperviscosity syndrome from that visual disturbance, confusion, and the like. They can actually get bleeding because they've got abnormal hemostasis, gallstones, gout. Paradoxical emboli makes sense because they've got this, this obligate right to left shunt, so they get stroke, cerebral abscesses. Heart failure tends to occur late. Uh, and they can, they can experience sudden death. But this is what I was talking about previously. The prognosis of Eisenmenger syndrome is better than primary pulmonary hypertension. General measures I've listed here for general measures of, uh, uh, for treatment, important to avoid intravascular depletion because they can have sudden hemodynamics collapse. These patients should all have bubble filters and they should be told that they should have bubble filters on their lines to avoid paradoxical emboli. I'm surprised how often this doesn't happen, but it should happen. What you don't want is regular phlebotomy just because someone sees their hemoglobin's 200. You only do it for symptoms, not based on a hematocrit. If they're going for surgery and it was more than 0.65, you may think about it to make to increase safety of surgery. If it was 0 0.7, 0 0.75, you may say, look, that's getting up there a bit, but usually they'll have symptoms. The issue is if you do it regularly and you try and bring them down to a normal hemoglobin, they'll become iron deficient and then they become more coagulant and more likely to have a stroke. We used to think you should anticoagulate them, probably not. Pulmonary vasodilator therapy is uh, effective. That was the BREATHE 5 trial. And um, often these patients need to be worked up uh, for transplantation. But that's a really difficult decision to make about the timing of that in terms of heart lung transplantation. Uh, so I've gone 10 minutes over time. I'll stop there. Um, in the next talk, whenever we, we want to lock that in, I'd be happy to cover in more detail um, things like tetralogy of fellow, double outlet right ventricle, the role of percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement, transposition, talk, focusing on the baffles just to improve understanding of that, and then Fontan circulation as well. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>